we're a bit ahead of the game, yet behind the game. What do I mean? We're on Daflamid Chesamid Bays, and because we have an extra few minutes, so I'd like to fill in a little bit of a gap that we have here on Daflamid Chesamid Bays. And you'll forgive me if it's a review, but you know, Chazorah and Dafyomi is also very, very important. So we're up to Nafkale Midasanya, which will count down from the top of Daflam and Chesamid Bays. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And if there's anyone interested in hearing the Shir on Daf Lamid Chesamid Aleph, you can find it up on YouTube. Nafkale Midasanya. The Gemara has a question now on Rabbi Yossi Aglili. Rabbi Yossi Aglili takes the Pasuk Asher Rasa literally. And it means, Asher Loa Rasa means that there's only a knas in a case of a woman that was never meureses. If she was at one point meureses, then she's out of the ballpark as far as knas is concerned. And now the Gemara asks, according to Rabbi Yossi Aglili, how do we know that in the case of Mafate, the payment is 50? And how do we know that in the case of Ones, the payment is Shkolin? And the Gemara answers, Nafkalei Midesanya, he derives it from a bride. So Kesef Yishkol Kemor Abesulos. In the parasha of Mafate, the Torah already refers to Moar Abesulos. Now, where do we find Moar HaBesulos? Moar HaBesulos is a certain amount of money that's earmarked to pay a Besula, presumably, because she experienced an Ones situation. He was raped. And that's what Rabbi Yotzi Aglili is going to derive in this brisa from the words Kimor HaBesulos in the Parsha Mafate, that the Parsha Mafate is setting up an analogy to the Parsha of Ones. And that is because the Torah in the Parsha Mafata utilizes the terminology Moar HaBesulos. Moar HaBesulos is a certain set amount of money that's designated to pay a Besula that's not mentioned in the Parsha Mafuta, but rather in the Parsha of Anusa. And not only that, we're going to switch it around the other direction as well. Umar HaBesulos Kaze. And the more Abisulos that's mentioned in the parsha of Mephata is equivalent to the more Abisulos in the parsha of Ones. And that's going to teach me a two way street open in both directions, Shkolim and Chamishim. Mar now asks the question that we've been waiting for the whole time here Kasha de Rabbi Akiva de Rabbi Akiva. We have a stira between the Mishnah and its version of Rabbi Akiva, as opposed to the Brisa and its version of Rabbi Akiva. In the presentation of ambition, Rabbi Akiva maintains that if she was an Arusa, and then she was divorced, and then afterwards she had an Onus or, or a Pithi situation, the Knas, instead of going to the father in this case, because of the Arusin, goes to the girl herself. Whereas Rabbi Akiva and the Bryce is reported as saying that even after Arisim, nothing changes at all. And the money accrues to the father. He continues to collect the money for his daughter, who's a Nara, even after Arisim and Gerishim. And the Gemara answers, Trey Tadmai, we have two transmissions of the view of Rabbi Akiva. And they're both valid. How could it be that Rabbi Akiva, as a result of a in the Brisa, 
is going to completely remove the puzzle from its simple, straightforward shot. We have a principle called a mikra yotzim de pshuto. We have to be loyal to pshuto shal mikra. The Torah says that it's a woman asher lo orasa. And now Rabbi Akiva, as recorded in the Brisa, is telling us that it doesn't make a difference whether she was a Rasa or not a Rasa. So why did the Torah specify and restrict it to a case of a woman asher lo a Rasa? We're going to take the word a Rasa and we're going to rewrite the vowels, the vocalization of the word, as if it had said arusa. And what it means is that at the time of the onus, when the rape took place, she was not an arusa. So the Gemara says, what are you talking about? Arusa vaskila. If she's an arusa, I don't need the Torah to tell me that she's not an arusa at the time of the onus. If she was an Arusa at the time of the onus, then we apply the principle of him, maybe the rabbi mine. He's Chayav Misa for having a relationship with a married woman. We have the sheet of Rabba, which now is being used by the Gemara as a Havamina. And according to Rabba, we don't apply the principle of him, maybe the rabbi mine in the case of a Knas. Because it's a chidush a chidsha Torah. And therefore, we apply both the chiv misa and we implement the death penalty. And at the same time, we make him pay the knas. And in the Havamina, when she was an, an Arusa at the time of the onus, the Torah is telling me to suspend the principle of him, maybe the rabbi, and at the same time, they will put him to death having a relationship with a married woman will impose the knas. So Gemara says, well, Rabba, but what are you going to say according to Rabba, the Omar, Chidushu Chechid Shetorah V'Knas Afagav V'Mikta Moshalim? Rabba, in fact, holds, like that Hava mean, but for Rabba, it's the Maskana, that we suspend the operation of him with the Rabbi in the case of the knas. If that be the case, then how are we going to interpret the Pasuk? Asher Lo Oros, Asher Lo Arusa. And you're going to tell me that I show Arusa because if she's an Arusa, then he doesn't pay knas. That's not so. Because even if she's an Arusa, according to Rabba, he will pay the knas. And the more answers, Savra Lok, Rabbi Akiva de We're going to have to assume that Rabba holds like the version of Rabbi Akiva as reported by our Mishnah. And Asherlo Arasa means that instead of the father collecting the knas, she herself connects the knas, collects the knas in the case of an Arusa. Then we don't have the problem of Kim Levi the Rabbin. And this is where we wanted to start for today officially. The Bryce records two opinions as to who collects and pockets the knas. The first opinion is something. That's explicit in the Torah. And we wonder why there's going to be a second dissenting opinion, namely that the father pockets the knas. What do you mean, liatzma? The Torah says, the Torah says explicitly that the payment is delivered to the father. How is it possible to take the pasuk v'nasan ha'ich hashokhev imala v'anara and tell me that she collects the knas? The old case that we've been discussing over and over again. She was given to marriage by her father. And after the Arisim, there was a divorce. And then, unfortunately, she had what she had, the, the episode that took place. The Kamifugi, and now we interpret this Machlokas recorded in the Brisa in the light of the two versions of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva in the Brisa. Rabbi Akiva now mentioned of the opinion that the money is collected by the Nara herself. She's no longer in, in the Rishus of her father because she already had Erisid and Gerishim. Whereas 
the Brysas of the opinion that Rabbi Akiva never said such a thing. And that even after Erison and Gerishin, she still has to give the money of the Knas over to her father, goes into his bank account, and he has the rights and the Zchus to collect those monies, even after Gerishin. Erison plus Gerishin. And that's the first sheeta here in this price of Knas Olavio. Omar Abaye Ba Oleha Umesa. Never. Hopefully, she didn't die as a result of the rape. Not directly. And uh, she died before what's called Hamad Abidin. In other words, the father did not yet get a chance to put forward his claim and sue the Ma'anix. And in the meantime, never she died. I don't know why he's in the mood, the father, after losing his daughter, but okay, so he has lawyers and so forth and so on. And maybe he wants to put up a monument in memory of his daughter. And he wants to collect Hamishim Kesef. I mean, that's a lot of money. But he cannot collect from the Ma'anis. Why? Because the key of keys is not just the moment of Ones, but the moment of Hamada Bedin. And at the time that he sued in court, she was already gone. The monies will be paid to the father of the live Nara, the Lola V. Mesa, but not to the father of never a deceased. And the Gemara says, Milsa de Pshita Leila Baye, mi boy Leila Rav. Rav was never really sure about this. Because after all, at the time of the onus, she, the narrow, was alive and well. And that's what fixes in stone the Chiv Knas. Hamad Abedin is only a technicality in order to be Mavarer as Hadovar and bring evidence to the effect that this no good scoundrel was Ma'anis, this woman. Just, just pointing out, uh, you, you said before, it, it, it can't be from the action itself that she died, because otherwise he'd be high. Again, we'd have come in the Well, again, I, I didn't mean that he killed her. You know, I'm saying he was in a state of shock. They sent her to, uh, in America, we would say Bellevue, Nebuchadnezzar, they gave her shock treatments. And at the end, you know what I'm saying? I'm just saying? I was just being, trying to be funny to get a, a laugh out of you, Joe. That's all I was trying to do. Because it's a little bit strange that a man rapes a woman and then she dies. You know, like, is there any connection between the two things? When I was a kid, we used to play Dado. You remember that? You you connect the dots. You remember that game? Uh, you you weren't you weren't around. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. So what's Rava now vacillating about? Boy, Rava. Rava has a suffix. Later on, the Gemara is going to talk about a case where at the time of the rape, she was a Nara, but the Hamada Bedin, the lawsuit didn't come to the attention of the, of the court until she was a Bogaris. And the Gemara wanders back and forth, Rava vacillates, who collects the Knas in that case? Should we say that now that she's a Bogaris, she's out of the resources of her father, she collects the Knas, or should we say, no, forget about Hamada Bedin. Hamada Bedin is just a technicality, but the Chiv to pay Knas was etched in stone at the time of the Maisav Vera, time of Ones. And at that time, Baruch Hashem, she was a Nara, and her father had rights to the Knas. And Rava, in that suffix, is now going to fit like a glove, in this case of a suffix, of Mesa. How so? Yesh Baga Bekever, Ein Baga Bekever. Let's see what that means. Yesh Baga Bekever. And that means Dibnohavi. Okay, now those two words, the are going to be very problematic if we take them literally. But what, what will first, I'll give you a more of a loose translation of these two words, the and then we'll give it a literal translation, which is going to bring the Gemara to a problem and a brick wall that's going to force us to reinterpret the words, the but the Bnahavi in a figurative way means that the father is out of the picture. Why? Because she is a Bogaris. What does that mean? She's a Bogaris. She died at the age of 12 and a quarter. Ah, but before her mother had been, before it got to the courts, three months plus passed, 
and she became a Bogeres posthumously. And that knocks the father out of the box because he has no rights to collect any mo money, any funds that are coming into a Bogeres. The Torah only gives him rights to a Nara. Or Ein Bagar Bekever. What's Ein Bagar Bekever? She died at the age of 12 and a quarter. She was a Nara and she remains a Nara. And therefore the father has rights to collect even three plus months down the line because she remains a Nara. And the father's rights to collect his daughter, his Nara's knas, are frozen at the moment that she dies. Now, wait a second. This was very nice if you take the Gemara figuratively, but let's take the Gemara literally and translate it word for word. It says, and if Yesh Bagar Bekever, not only does the Gemara point out, and Ravan and Suffolk point out that the father is out of the picture, but it says, Do you see those two okay. words in the Gemara? What does sorry, that mean? Sorry, what does it matter whether he, she died or not? Even if she's alive, would you have the same question? Or no, it if, if she's alive, then Clearly, there's a knas, and clearly the father's out of the picture. Who therefore will yeah. collect that knas? She does. She collects the okay. knas. Okay. But in a case where she died, obviously she cannot collect the knas. Okay. So, so who definitely... will collect the knas if you hold yesh bagar bekever? And the answer is, and if you take the Gemara literally, the So she has a son. And this is going to take us back to the Rashi that Bobby pointed out uh, in the last year on, uh, when was it, on Friday? Umima Avra? How could it be that we take this price so literally, or rather literally, and Dibnahavi, that she's a Nara and she has a child? And she become pregnant? For Tony Rabbi Bibi, this is not a political statement here, Rabbi Bibi, Kame de Rav Nachman, there are three women who are permitted to use contraception. And by the way, the use of contraception in this particular case is not l'chatchiwa. You know, the Gemara didn't have the sophisticated methods of contra contraception that we have today in terms of technology, in terms of shots and whatnot. But we're talking about a very kind of old fashioned method of contraception called a moch. I think in English it loosely translates as a sponge or maybe in a more sophisticated context, a diaphragm. And this is not something that we're very happy about. Why? Because it somehow interferes with the normal flow, if I can borrow that term, of an intimate relationship. So we'll rely on a kula if necessary. Now, what makes it necessary to allow a leniency of a woman using a moch? One of three cases, all of which have a common denominator. And that is a certain danger. Now, to whom is there danger? So let's go through it. Elohim, number one, Tana, and that's going to be a danger to her, to the woman, the wife herself. Number two, Mi'u Beres, and that's going to be a danger to the fetus, as we'll soon see. And then Minika, which is going to be a danger to the nursing baby. And please keep in mind that Today, you could debate back and forth how critical is nursing, but back in the time of the Gemara, nursing was almost pikuach nefesh. They didn't have materna. Well, I don't know the Canadian version of materna, or maybe materna is a Canadian company, I don't know. But they didn't have that kind of stuff back in the day. So nursing was absolutely critical. Katana, shematis aber vitamus. Now, most of the Rishonim, with the exception 
of Rashi, that's Bobby's Rashi from Daf, what was it, Lamed Ches, no, Lamed Zion. Most Rishonim would say that you have to put an extra word in the Gemara. You read it, Shema Tisaber Vishema Tomus. She may become pregnant and she might die. And this is based on the Gemara in Mesech Tiyavamis that comes to the conclusion that there have been cases of a Kana who actually gave birth to a viable child. But it's very, very unlikely. What's more likely is that Nebuch, as a result of the pregnancy and the harm done to this young girl's body, she will die. But we don't want her to become pregnant. Number two, Muberes. She's already pregnant. And believe it or not, Ghazal understood and you could look on Google and see if you can find anyone on Google who agrees with this biology, that a woman who's pregnant can become pregnant a second time through a subsequent intimacy. And what's going to happen when she becomes pregnant a second time? Gematasa ubra sandal. Her first fetus, her first pregnancy, we always say kolakodim zocha, is going to get almost destroyed by the new pregnancy. And again, there are details here that are gory. I don't want to go into them. You'll decide if you want to go into them on your own, what exactly the word sandal means in this case, and so forth and so on. Menika, Shemitigmo, let's be not. Once a woman becomes pregnant, it's very difficult for her to nurse. And if she terminates her nursing to the newborn baby, that might endanger the life of the baby. Ezoik Tano. At what age do we allow a girl, a young girl, to use a moch? In other words, at what age do we feel that based on the science of our day, the, the science of the Talmudic times, she might indeed become pregnant? And as a result of the pregnancy, she could endanger her life. If she's less than 11, then the Yasser Al-Khan, Mishamesh Kedak of we're not going to be lenient and allow for the interference, whatever level of interference there is in the sexual right. act as a result of using a moch. Why? Because if she's less than 11 years old, the chances are she won't become pregnant. And if she's more than 12 years old, if she does become pregnant, she'll be able to carry to the full term and her life is not in danger. But you see again and again how the Gemara is looking for a matir to allow tashmish b'moch. It's not so simple. And we'll only do it when there is a pressing need. And in the cases of less than 11 or more than 12, there's no pressing need. So the whole business about a katana using a moch is going to last for one year. We don't want to use a moch. We don't want a moch. No moch. Do you have it, Rabosa? We don't want a moch. That's the sheet of the Chachamim. What do you mean you don't want a moch? You're going to allow this dangerous situation, whether it's to the woman herself, whether it's to the, to the, the fetus in her body, whether it's to the Newborn baby that's suckling from her mother's breast. What are you talking about? And HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to have Rachamim. Mishum Shenemar HaPosik in Mishle Shomer Pesoyim Hashem. God protects the innocent. One of the most uh, complicated halachic analyses is this principle of Shomer Psoim Hashem. And the basic rule is, again, in a very, very general superficial way, is that whenever the normal way is, is, is this is the way we live our lives, then God will protect us. We won't consider it a dangerous situation if this is part of normal behavior. So Rabbi Moshe Feinstein was matir smoking, until the Surgeon General's report, if I remember correctly, he goes to show him, so much him, everybody smokes. I remember when I took my fire to get accepted to Yeshiva University. I'm not going to mention his name, but he was a Gullaby Israel. He used to smoke half cigarettes. 
cut every cigarette into half. And he wouldn't throw it out until his fingers were yellow. I thought he was going to go up and smoke. And when I got to Eretz Yisrael, and I learned to the certain yeshiva here in Israel, I went up to the Ezra's Noshim. There was a, you know, a, a vilon, you know, I opened the vilon. You couldn't see anything. The whole base major was one cloud, and it wasn't Ananya Govan. <laughs> so Moshe Paskin, show me Psoyim Hashem. So it's normal for a wife to have a relationship with her husband, and God will protect her. That's the sheep of the Chachamim. We see very carefully, very clearly here, that it's almost unheard of for a katana to, to give birth to a, to a baby girl. And now we're talking about a Nara. So she would probably have to have gotten pregnant. The conception would have taken place when she was a katana. And then she would have to give birth when she was a Nara during that six-month period between 12 and 12 and a half. So the says, if he tamed the Abrak, she Nara. Why not say the following? That maybe she didn't become pregnant and carry a full nine months, which means that she became pregnant as a katana, which is very unlikely to be able to carry the full term and have a son who would inherit her. But perhaps she became pregnant as a narrow. But wait a minute, she died as a narrow. That would mean that her pregnancy could last maximum six months. So the Gemara says, Do we have such a situation that a woman carries six months? Today, by the way, we know that this is possible. But in the time of the Gemara, it was considered impossible for a woman to give birth to a viable child that would survive after six months of pregnancy. When you get to Naros, which means she's 12 and a day, and she has some money Naros, you just simply look at the calendar, you fast forward six months, and she becomes a Bulgarian. There's no need for anything else to happen. You just simply count and calculate six months. And don't argue with me, says the Gemara. But you'll argue with me, but Siru the Lekot Feika, maybe what Shmuel meant was that there's a minimum of six months. But there's a maximum that goes even beyond six months. But again, now the Gemara is assuming that there's some sort of simonim that would clinch her bagus. The Gemara doesn't even bother going into detail about this because the Gemara completely rejects this Havamina, Mikol Vacho in its root. Ha Elokom. Shmuel added the word Ella to tell you that it's exactly six months. It doesn't depend upon any factors whatsoever, just the passage of time. So therefore the Gemara now strikes from the record the two words, Ella, Now we go back to the suffix of Rava and we reformulate it. And we're talking about a case where the onus took place when she was a Nara. The father did not get a chance to be Mamed Bidin to sue the rapist until his daughter never died. Yesh Bagar Bekever. If she became a Bogeres Bekever, which knocks off whom? The father, he's knocked out of the ring. Oka Ha'av. And the Masifta adds another few words, and he says, after Hufka, Hufka's Chutzah Shal Av, Beknasseh, is how One Slo Yechuyev Leshalem Klal. That's what Rabbi was one. The Ones is off, the Ma'anis is off the hook. Why? Because she's dead. She has no heirs. The only one who could possibly connect to collect the Knas is the father. And now we're holding Yesh Baga Bekever. If we hold Yesh Baga Bekever, she's already Bogaris. The father's out of the picture. Why doesn't the father collect as an heir? One question, just one second. Ah. No, 
we're, we're missing the point. What we're saying now is that if Yesh Bagar Bekever, then we go back to the Drosha, who was it? Uh, of Abaye. Belola via Mesa. Just one second. Let me see if anybody says that. Ah, well, no, he says something different. I had a whole lump this year, but the, uh, the Sift I even underlined it, but I forgot about it. There's no Yerush on a Knaps. Right, it's Rashi. Rashi says it. Kahav, Rashi Great. says. Rashi says it. So I quoted the name of the Sifta, and the Masifta quotes the name of Rashi. <laughs> so you could decide whether you want to quote the Masifta or Rashi. Yeah, you're right. It's sloppy uh, uh, scholarship here. Anyway, maybe her brother will get it, not her, by by uh, Yerusha. Oh, so the answer is there's no class, there's no Yerusha in class. Now, if we want to study Eshnochlin, we'll have to go through the sugis there and figure out why there's no Yerushan Knaps. I have a feeling, just Libi Omerly, that Knaps is called Rory and not Muxon. Are you familiar with those terms? Do you ever learn Eshnochlin? All right. So Joe, question then her son also shouldn't, well, that's what we're saying now. The son doesn't collect because there's no son. Uh, yeah, the but the even day. the first question, that why would why would her son get it all, uh, in the first place? At that point, yeah. In other words, also it should be the question of Roy, Roy or Muxuk should not like should mean that the son wouldn't collect either, even if there was a son. Does Rashi address this? Let's just read the Rashi Poka of where is the Rashi now? Poka of Poka is Tvia Who Knasle Mamun says a Rishali of Via Betarsi Rusha Kamadalo Gavtek. At, at this point, the Gemara has eliminated the son also because he he there can't he can't be there. So no, but uh, but Joe's question is excellent. I mean, wh why do you have to bother going through a whole you know somersault in the air that she couldn't have given birth? Why just say there's no Yerusha through Knas? Again, I, I just don't want to lose the you know they give me an yeah, extra, a certain amount of time here. Uh, I'll just took a quick a quick peek here on Daflam and Tesom and Al, if I have something called Biure Rashi. One second. Lam and Tesom and Al, let's just see. And the Debra Masko we said was Poka Al. You wouldn't say that the son's talking about the son who's the son of the action. From the from the, anu, the, the Anus. I don't know if that make what would that make any difference. I don't. I don't see why that. If it's not Yerusha, it would be a, considered like he's. He's I, like no, no game. He's, he has no time now. All right. Yeah. I don't know. Let's go on. Oh, Dilma ain bagar bitever, which means that the status of the Nara is frozen at the time that she dies, and she's always a Nara below Pokav, and therefore the father could go. In. So again. Abaye had a special Xeris Akosov that there's no Knas in the case of Avia Mesa. Rava didn't have that. He was only wondering whether or not there is a status of Bogeres to a woman, a Nara, after her death. And according to Rava, simply what happens is if you hold Yesh Bagabekever, the Knas falls between the cracks. There's no one to collect the knas, because there's no Yerush on knas. The father is out of the picture because the father never collects knas for Bogeris. Barbara Vashi Boile Hachi, he had a different formulation of Rava Suffolk, Misa Osa Baigus. Maybe at the time that she dies, she becomes a Bogeris. And according to the first side in Ravashi Suffolk, immediately at that moment when she dies, the father loses his rights to collect the knas. And again, we're going to have to add what we said before, that there's no Yerusha on the knas. O ein osa bagus. Or shall we say no? The father continues to have rights to collect his daughter's uh, knas as long as you hold ein bagar bekever, or alternatively, if he gets quick to the draw, to be tovea the knas before that extra three months that we spoke about passes by, and here we have Teku.
Again, there's a long discussion here in Nechronim, but I, I'm going to have to beg you because if I get messed up here, it's not going to be good. Okay. What happens if you hold like that shita that her din changes after Arison, as far as the father is concerned? And we have the two versions of Rabbi Akiva, the Mishnah and the Brisa. And now, immediately after the Ones took place, she became an Arusa. So we have no problem with Kim Lebi the Rabbi, obviously. She was not an Arusa at the time of the Arison, but who gets to collect the Knas? Shall we say that the Nara herself gets to collect the Knas, which means that with Arison, she leaves the Rishus of her father. Again, that's a very difficult position to maintain, but at least as far as Knas is concerned, we might fit it into the context of Knas. And this would, again, reflect the Shita of Rabbi Akiva and our Mishnah, that after Arison, the father loses his rights to collect Knas. Or should we say no? That since at the time of the Ones, she was Bershus Ha'ah, and she didn't leave the Rishus Ha'ah as far as collecting Knas is concerned. Because immediately, with the Misa Ones, the Knas is frozen in place, and the father gets rights to the Knas. Why, why, don't, my we, why, don't, we, to Rava, why don't we look at the time of Amun Who's talking? I, I hear a voice. I don't... Huh? Who, who's uh, talking uh, here? Me, me, me. Hold on. Who is me? Oh, there you are. Okay. Why don't we look at when the, 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 the Bezdin uh, awards the, the, the Knas? Why are we looking at uh, uh, the time frame as to when it happens? So if again, you, if you... we, we want to know what exactly is Bezdin doing? Is the purpose of Bezdin what we call clarative? Clarative meaning to clarify that so-and-so has a chiv to pay money. Like, for example, in the case of Alva, Bezdin only plays a role of Biru. Or is Bezdin actually creating the Knas? Like, for example, we have Allah of Mode of Knas Potter. That's because Bezdin creates the Knas. So Rava is vacillating on the following question. At the time of the Ones, she was a Pnuya. Then, before Hamada Bidin, by time T2 in the middle, she became an Arusa. Mahu, to whom does the Knas accrue? Shall we say that through Arison, she leaves the Rishus of her father as far as Knas is concerned, which would reflect the sheet of Rabbi Akiva in our Mishnah, that with Arison, the father is out of the picture as far as Knas is concerned. Again, be very careful, because this is not a universal halach. In the Durham, as we'll see, the father still could be made for on the Durham, even though she's in a rusa. But in any event, as far as Knast, the Torah said, Asher lo Rasa. And after Arison, the father's out of the picture. That's where we keep in our mission. Or shall we say no? That since Bezdin, according to the second side in Rav's Suffolk, is only playing a role of evidence, of establishing facts on the ground, but the Maisa Machayev, that action, that episode that generates the Chiyuv Knas is the Ones. Then at the moment that the Ones took place, the father already clamps down on his legal rights to collect the Knas. Omale, Abai responds to Rav Amiksiv in Osan Lavia Nara Sher Lo Arusa. Does the Torah say that the father's? <laughs> rights are contingent on the fact that she's low arusa. That's not what it says in the Torah. If it would have said low arusa, it means the very moment that she became an arusa, the father is out of the picture. And then clearly the answer to Rabbi's question would be that she collects her knas rather than her father. But instead, the Torah says asher lo arusa. Orasa, not Arusa, but Orasa. And what that means is that if 
at the time of Nesina, because again, that Pesach says Vinasan, etc. At the time of Nesina, she's Loa Rosa. But now we're talking about a case where she wasn't married, then divorced, then she had the onus, but rather she had the onus when she was a Pnuya before the marriage. So therefore, Abai comes to the conclusion that the father could collect a knas even though she is now in Arusa. And that's even according to Rabbi Akiva and Mishnah. So Rabbi turns to Abai and says, Ulutamech, according to your logic, that the knas is always a monetary right of the father as long as she was a Nara Pnuya at the time of the Ones, is Hada Sanya, how are you going to interpret the following Brysa? So what happened is, not only after the Erisin, did she, after the Ones, did she have Erisin, but she also had Nesuit. She was taken into the Chupa. And in this case, the Brysa says, Knossoli Atzma, she collects the Knoss. Now, wait a second, let's apply your biblical exegesis, Abai. Let's be consistent. Does the Torah say anywhere that if she's in a Sua, that's a Tarti disaster to the Father's rights to collect the Knoss? It doesn't say that. And according to your logic, Abai, we should come to the conclusion that since the onus, the Misa onus, will fix in stone the father's rights, again, assuming she's an hour, right? The father's rights to collect her knas, then what difference does it make if she's an Asua? Why is it that with an Asua, the father loses, he forfeits his rights? The answer is because the Asua terminates and undermines the father's rishus over his daughter. So why not go a step further and apply that even in Erisun? Says Abai, what kind of a tushtel? You're comparing Erisun to Nesui? Did you not pass the course called Ishus 1.1? Achi hashta, hasam over there in the case of a Nesua. Hoel ubagris motziya mishasav. Nesui motziya mishasav. The father terminates his rights over his daughter because the post says, Binu Reo de Safia, with Bagrus, and so too with Nisuin. Once he gives her hand to Nisuin, he is out of the picture entirely. For example, if she takes a neder, the husband has exclusive rights to be made for the neder without the father whatsoever. He's not in the picture after Nisuin. And therefore, let's equate Bagrus with Nisuin. In both cases, she leaves the domain of her father. Just like in the case of Bogaret, Stalloch is that even though the onus took place when she was a Nara, the father is out of the picture with her Bagrus, and therefore she will collect and pocket her own class. So, too, in the case of Nesua, once there was Nesuin, even though the Mice onus took place when she was a Pnuya, nevertheless, with Nesuin, she leaves the rishus of the father, and clearly the knas is collectible by the daughter. What does that have to do with Arison? Ella Arison Mika Mafki Mishusei the Avogamri. Does a woman leave the, 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 the domain and the rishus of her father with Arison? That's not so. Open up to the Mesech in Durham, the 10th parak, and you'll see that after Arison, if she takes a ned there, then he who the Baila Barusa is Mefir Nidorea. The father plays a role in a farce the Durham. In fact, if he does not need for the nether beyond Shamo, then the nether is valid. But not Nara Murasa via Baila Mefir Nidorea. And that leads us to the Mishnah here on the bottom of Dafla Mites Amid Amafate no sein shlosha dvar the ones arba. So as we go along, we'll see that there's an element of chavala 
which is present and has to be taken care of for compensation purposes in the case of an ones, but it's missing, it's absent in the case of a mafat. In the case of ones, I'm sorry, let's start with the case of a fata that has only three, and then Onus has four. In the case of a fata, is no same boshes. He has to pay for boshes. Why is he paying for boshes? She was a consenting adult. Ah, but the answer is because who collects the boshes? She's a narrow, her father collects the boshes. So she has no right of mechila on the Boshes collection, the compensation that belongs and proves to her father. And the same is true with Pagam. Pagam means how much she was devaluated on the Shuk. I don't want to marry a girl who's already been had. Uknas. And then he's got to pay Chamishim Shkolim. But the Chidish of Mishnah said in addition to the Chamishim Shkolim, he's got to pay Boshes to Pagam. Most if all of our owners should know seen as her office at sign. And we're gonna have a whole sugi here. Does a woman in a case of Pitui suffer any sort of tsar? Such that her father, when she's in Arab, could collect the payment of tsar. But the Mishnah says no. Obviously, the Mishnah assumes that since she was a consenting a, adult, as we called it, if there's no tsar. I'm not sure exactly why the Mishnah had to add this. The Teferis Yisrael in Mishnah is, is that Leolam, the Mishnah wants to emphasize Leolam, Enam Afat, and No Saint Sa. In other words, there's an objective legal halachic status of Pitui being Potter from Sar. Even if Lu Yitzui, you would prove that she had Sar through the Pitui. She would not be able to collect the tsar. I don't know, but the Mishnah seems to be quite superfluous. What else? Is there any other difference between Ones and Mafat? Ones no semiyat. The payment of the Knas of Hamishim Shekel is immediate because he has to marry him, whether he likes it or not. But Mafat, he has to make a decision whether he wants to marry him. And if Lui Tzui marries her, he doesn't pay knas. But Shayotzi, Yotzi means if he decides that he's not going to marry her, then he has to pay the knas. What else is the difference between Ones and Mephato? Ones Shosa Batzito. He's got a drink in that very vessel that he, that he polluted. And it doesn't <clears throat> matter what she looks like. She might be a hinkatinker, you know, she, she uh, what do you call it in English? Um, she's lame. You, you remember the machlokas back on that Zayt, she pays a little bit You know, all those cases, she's a mukashkin. I don't know what she looks like. Gosh. What Alice. about what about her? What if she doesn't want him? Right. It's all conditional on the, on the, on the, on the other two members of the party. The three members of the party. One of them, it's even Balkarcha. The other two, they have to sign on. Number one, it's the Ma'anes Balkarcha. Number two, we need the, the consent of the father and the daughter. Now, if the father objects and vetoes, then it seems, and the Gemara is going to spend a lot of time working on this, that even if she wants to marry this, this no good schlub of a rapist, uh, nevertheless, her, his father her father has, has uh, veto power. And we're going to have to see why and how. Mefate? <laughs> he doesn't want to marry this girl. She's lame. She's blind. She's deaf. I don't know what she is. She's got all of Milas. You know, she's, uh, she's a muka shrin. He's rotzel lahotzi motzi. Again, the Gemara is going to reinterpret that to mean that if he wants to, he could reject her. Case at Shosa Batsiso, Afili Chiteres, Afili Hisuma, Afili Mukashchin. This would not be the woman he would want to marry, but you're no good love of a scoundrel. You're a rapist. We don't have, the Torah has very low tolerance for a rapist. 
Although, we're going to see in the Gemara one cooler for a rapist, he doesn't have to pay the ksuba. But okay, that's a different story. Nimta Badvara Veru. Now we get into a sugi which is called Ese Doche Losase. The Ones married this girl, and now the Torah says he's not allowed to live with her. I don't know, this be, you know, this raises his eyebrows. Like, you know, I don't want to say these words, but, you know, she was raped and I don't know. I don't know what happened. Either she was a kind of a loose woman to begin with or she became a little bit loose afterwards. I don't know. But it turns out that testimony has it that she had an extramarital relationship. He's not allowed to live with her, but yet he has a misfit to live with her. Oshena Rutli love his love of Israel. She's a Mamzeris. He's not allowed to marry a Mamzeris. Ainer Ashoy Lakaim. No essay do philosophers. Shenem are Velosia Le Icha Icha Ruya Lo. And the Gemara is going to get into a Mimonish. If this Drosha is telling me that the essay doesn't override the Losa says, so we should derive from this a universal conclusion that there's no such thing as essay do philosophers. I don't know what we're going to do with Kalayan Bittit. Or we're going to say the following, that this is not really a drasha gemura, but the Gemara is giving an asmachta, but really it means there's no essay tochalosa in this case, and the Gemara is going to rack its brains to try to figure out why there's no essay tochalosa. Tsar demai. What exactly is the tsar here that she saw? Amar avur de Shmuel. This is begeder dok v'tishkach, meaning we're going to learn what it says here, the name of avur de Shmuel, and then we're going to forget it. You're going to have to scratch it from the record. Tsar is Chavata al Gabi Karka. The rapist took her and threw her down on the ground. Maskifla Rav Rav Zera Elamiyata Chavata al Gabi Shirayim Hachi Nami de Potur. You're going to tell me that Tsar only means Chavata al Gabi Karka, but he was very soft with her. He lowered her down to a mattress. If you can say maybe he doesn't pay tsar because she doesn't solve the tsar, there must be another tsar because it says in a brisa, Rab Shimon Yehuda Omer Mishum Rabbi Shimon, our owners ain't a mishamis at tsar. Mipnesha so far lit tsar tachas pile. And this is the unique shita, the dissenting view of Rab Shimon and Yehuda, the, the, the chachamim are going to object. And according to Reb Shimon, there's no chi of tsar in the case of Onis. I'm sorry. Only men could have written that.